This is not just another book chat podcast. Lifelong reader Cindy Rollins joins teachers Angelina Stanford and Thomas Banks for an ongoing conversation about the skill and art of reading well. Explore the lost intellectual tradition and discover how to fully enter into the great works of literature. Learn what books mean while delighting in the sheer joy of imagination. Each week, we will rescue story from the ivory tower and bring it to your couch, your kitchen, and your commute. The literary life is for everyone, because in the words of Stratford Caldecott, to be enchanted by story is to be granted a deeper insight into reality. Join us for an ever unfolding discussion of how stories will save the world. This is the Literary Life Podcast. Welcome back to the Literary Life Podcast. I'm Angelina Stanford, and with me is the man formerly known as the mysterious Mr. Banks. Yes, yes, indeed. I'll wear that title. Yes, he's. if you've been listening a while, he's been uh, chafing against his title, the mysterious Mr. Banks, so I've been calling him the increasingly less mysterious Mr. Banks. I think you're still well, mysterious. I, I would just hate for us to be guilty of false advertisement. I mean, which which statement I think is appropriate given what we're about to talk about. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to, you know, be uh, held up uh, as more interesting than I actually am. But you could so. think of me as like your your personal copywriter. Like I'm, you know, I'm 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 your ad man. I could mm-hmm. I could come up with some of the some of the fun things that Lord Peter's coming up with in his in his ad campaigns. I, I could be good at that too. I could be your hype man. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Angelina okay, so it's, funny, it's funny that you say we will be getting started here in a second with Dorothy Sayers murder must advertise but it's funny that you say you think I'd be good at that because um my very first attempt at a major was in marketing and advertising because I thought it would be super fun to write ads and you would be good at that but you would also go insane Indeed. working in an office and that is why I did not pursue that but mm. um later on when I when I read a biography of Dorothy Sayers and and, and found out that uh, she had also traveled that path, it just made me even more think she was my soul sister. Because I, I am very clever with coming up with like jingles and taglines, as you 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 know. So yeah, yeah, that was something I had considered, but no, no. Especially after watching Mad Men, I think no, that that definitely was not the world for me. I'm I'm happy in the world of English literature. But yes, we are going to be talking today, or start talking about Dorothy Sayers. Murder Must Advertise, which is um, one of my two favorites of hers. My two favorites are Gaudy Night and Murder Must Advertise. And we'll talk about why that's the case and um, the fact that those were kind of deliberate departures from the detective form for her. So we'll get into that in a second. But uh, before we do, a word from our sponsors, which is us. Uh, We've got something going on at the House of Humane Letters uh, coming up next month that we're just beside ourselves with excitement about. This has been in the works for a while. And we're very excited to finally be able to launch it. We have amongst us um, a woman who has been teaching music at the college level for 20 years. And she uh, she's part of our Patreon. And we've gotten to know her pretty well over the last few years. And at our summer camp, she gave some fantastic sessions on Scheherazade, which is one of my all-time favorite pieces of music. And I have to tell you, not until she led me through it did I realize it was the piece is actually telling the story of Scheherazade. It just blew my mind as she was pointing out. Okay, so this is this is the king, and and you know the, and this is Scheherazade, and you know just really showed how the whole thing was telling a story, and just blew my mind. And I thought this must be shared with a larger audience, and so I pitched her the idea of doing a webinar where she could teach us how to make sense of how to listen, honestly, how to read a symphony, because she really does believe. It's telling a story and it works just like the way I say stories work. And so that is going to be happening. And take a listen to this um, to this description she wrote, which I just love. Just as the modern reader struggles with the loss of the shared literary culture and imaginative landscape of the literary tradition, so has the modern listener lost touch with the imaginative language of music. C.S. Lewis says that it is the first duty of a reader to read the work like the original audience. And this is no less true for a composition. But how can we do that when we have lost the thread that links us to that tradition? We will learn where the symphony comes from and how to encounter the journey it leads us on 
with Carita Thompson guiding us through Symphony No. 42 in D major by Franz Joseph Haydn, the father of the symphony himself. We are so excited about that. That is going to be happening on October 21st. And as she ends her ad here, she says, join her as she draws on aspects of the literary tradition and story to learn how to encounter the universal images through the sounds of the symphony. Doesn't that sound amazing, Mr. Banks? Are you so excited for that? I am. I, I'm saying this as someone who knows uh, pitifully little about Haydn, honestly. I mean, I, I, I didn't know, even know he was the I, father I, of the I, symphony. I, well, sure. I mean, I, I guess I know like the oh some of his sacred music, like the seven last words from the cross, but I don't think I could name many more pieces than that. So yeah, yeah this will be an education for me. I'm super excited. So this is on um, October 21st, but as everything we do, it's live or later. And so the recording will be years to keep and you can watch it over and over. Um, if you're interested in checking that out, you can go to houseofhumaneletters.com and click on that webinar tab and all the information will, will be right there. We also, she also put together a playlist of the music she'll be covering and Ali's got that, uh, I think he's got that on our YouTube channel, uh, which by the way, uh, our, our sound engineer, our producer Kiel has, uh, set up the podcast to now be broadcasting on YouTube too. So just another place you can find us. Um, but we've got that uh, playlist set up for you. If you want to start listening to those, it'd be great to do for morning time. Just start listening to that with your family and then get ready for her to explain to you what it is you've been listening to. So I'm 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 super thrilled about that. So shout out to her. I know she's very excited um, and I'm expecting big, big things from her. I think this is going to be just a fantastic night. I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, well, so... Should we jump in with some commonplace quotes so we I can start talking about idea. my my girl, Dorothy Sayers? Mm -hmm. I adore her so much. Okay, you give us one. So mine comes from a poem by Rudyard Kipling called The City of Brass. And it's uh, just two lines from that poem. And it ceased, and God granted them all things for which they had striven. And the heart of a beast in the place of a man's heart was given. Oh, man. I don't know why, but that seemed appropriate to today's episode, kind Seems of. Very Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness, too. Actually, sort of, yeah. Do, am I remembering correctly? Was there a Rudyard Kipling reference in the chapters we read? I think there was. Or maybe it's a little further in the book. There might be. I'm not, I don't remember one. I'm, I'm having some vague memory of Emily Rabel texting me that there was a Rudyard Kipling quote, but it might be a little further into the, okay. into, into the book. But I may also be getting that confused with something else. All right, so we will be talking about all things Dorothy Sayers, but right here I've got a quote for you from her. Um, she was for a long time the president of the Detection Club, which included Agatha Christie, and um, at one point Ches Chesterton was the first president. Um, Allingham, I think. Oh, Allingham and, and Nio Marsh and Ronald Knox and Anthony Barclay and you know the the whole the whole gang, the whole gang of the Golden Age detective novel, and she wrote extensively. I mean, she's just got an incredible mind, which we'll we'll talk about her more in a second. But she wrote a lot about the detective novel. And I have an essay of hers that she wrote in The Omnibus of Crime uh, on the history of the detective novel. It's very, very good. Um, she, you know, she goes through Edgar Allan Poe and Sherlock Holmes and Wilkie Collins. Of course, she thinks The Moonstone is the most perfect detective novel ever written. And do you remember that you tracked down for me a rare copy. A rare copy. Yeah. You had to get it from Australia. A rare copy of the Everyman edition of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone because it had the introduction written by Dorothy Sayers. Indeed it does. That's the kind of wonderful husband you are because you know you know your wife very well and I was thrilled. Um, so anyway, this is a quote from um, an essay she wrote on the history of the detective novel. And it was it, it pleased me to no end because, of course, I have long time been a believer that a detective novel is a displaced romance. Um, if you've listened to the podcast before, we've talked about this, that that romance doesn't mean love story, but romance means a, a nine on a quest story, a medieval a medieval story in, in that sense. And, of course, Northrop Fry, our, our <laughs> patron saint literary critic, talks a lot about how the detective novel is a displaced romance. In other words, it's got all the trappings of the medieval romance, but it's been taken out of its place in the Middle Ages and plopped into the modern age. So that's what we mean when we say displaced, taken out of one setting and plopped into another. So I was thrilled in her essay when she's talking about the detective novel uh, that she says this. So she's, she's worried she does her whole history thing and she gets to the modern age, the golden age detective novel. And she's, 
Um, she's making the point that actually uh, I've read other people make this point, too, that you can't have the detective novel until you have um, a world in which a police force is trusted. Mm. And so she talks about uh, she talks about why it takes off in England and France as opposed to some other places, because that was the first place where you had a kind of a trustworthy police force. It's one of the reasons why it takes a lot longer in the United States, because we don't have. We don't have that kind of thing. And even when we do, we get the hardball detective, which is very suspicious of the police force. Yeah, you know, the police are usually kind of villainous in the mm -hmm. Dashiell Hammett. Uh, yeah, Chandler. yeah, they're they're part of the whole um, obstacle that the detective yeah. has to overcome in the hardboiled American tradition. Um, usually what happens is the detective has to work outside of the system. So and he'll usually be an ex-cop or, yeah, or yeah, often he'll yep, be an ex-cop. I was just going to say that ex-cop who, yeah. who gets who gets pushed down in some kind of way and, and the police are also... Drinks too much. Well, very often the American um, hard-boiled detective novels kind of raise the question of what's the difference between the police and the bad guys because yeah. there's so much corruption and everywhere. Anyway, anyway, so that's that's a whole other tradition. But So she's making the point that you have to have sort of the rise of a trustworthy police force uh, for the for the, for the detective novel to, to work as a genre. Okay, so she's so she's she's brought us up to the 19th century here. And so I'll pick it up there. In the 19th century, the vast unexplored limits of the world began to shrink at an amazing and unprecedented rate. The electric telegraph circled the globe. Railways brought remote villages into touch with civilization. Photographs made known to the stay-at-homes the marvels of foreign landscapes, customs, and animals. Science reduced seeming miracles to me mechanical marvels. Popular education and improved policing made town and country safer for the common man than they had ever been. In the place of the adventurer and the knight-errant, popular imagination hailed the doctor, the scientist, and the policeman as saviors and protectors. But if one could no longer hunt the manticora, one could still hunt the murderer. If the armed escort had grown less necessary, yet one still needed the analyst to frustrate the wiles of the poisoner. From this point of view, the detective steps into, right, into his right place as the protector of the weak, the latest of the popular heroes, the true successor of Roland and Lancelot. That's a really wonderful passage. Isn't that great? I also... What is, what is a manticora? I think like a, I think like a, sea, a mythical sea okay. beast, like a... Yeah. All right. I'm kind of wondering that too. Yeah. So her point is in the modern age, we we can't any longer say things like there are unexplored islands or there are sea creatures yeah. out there for us to be afraid of. Um, and so writing that kind of story where you're out there to slay a dragon in a world which every corner of the globe has already been discovered and we can say there are no dragons here. Um that that story then morphs into into a new kind of knight errant, um, the detective. I love that, and we'll talk about the detective story as romance as we go through. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I love that. I love that she's so conscious about. It. Of course, she translated the Song of Roland. She she knows this stuff backwards and forwards. She does. And I love that she sees that uh, Lord Peter, Lord Peter's a knight. Um. All right. Well, we're gonna start off. I think talking about the Golden Age detective novel in general. And then we'll make our way to to Dorothy Sayers. And honestly, I don't think you can consider the Golden Age detective novel and the genre she's working in unless you kind of step back and look at the state of the world. And that requires us to talk a little bit about the effect that World War I had on like the global psyche. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it can't be overstated. It, it is almost impossible for us to comprehend how much the world changed as a result of World War I. I mean, we're still reeling from the change, honestly. It was the first war in European history in a very long time, which had caused the map of Europe to be redrawn. Mm -hmm. um, also the first war in Europe in a very, very long time where everybody I, I had a teacher once who put it this way everybody had either lost somebody they cared about or knew somebody who lost somebody they cared about that just wasn't true of any war within living memory mm -hmm. um, and then on in another way you can think about it that um it's like the war pulled the rug out from under everybody's feet so in the 19th century you have an optimism which 
I think exceeds even the optimism we have right now in our own age. Like we believe we we live in a very optimistic age in terms of what we think tech will do. We think we think tech is ushering us into some kind of golden age. Of course, we, we we're now at a point I think where there's a lot more loud voices saying maybe that's not the direction we're going into. But that's been the direction we've looked at for a while. That that tech is going to cure all of our ills. Um, but but the 19th century, the Victorians, I think, surpassed that. Um, they really, really thought that they were on the brink of making heaven on earth. Um, and it wasn't without good reason they thought that. I mean, we're seeing um, things like in London, um, Prince Albert bringing, a pa a bar a pa uh, bringing about um, sanitation. The Crystal Palace exhibition. Well, the Crystal Palace exhibition. I was going to get to that in a second. But even just something small like having a sanitation system in London meant suddenly all these outbreaks of cholera are stopping, right? So disease seems like it's getting under control. The Crystal Palace was Prince Albert. Since Prince Albert loved technology and, and being advanced and being modern. The Crystal Palace was his place where he um, just kind of showed off the world of the future. And since you brought up, I mean, since we're talking about crime here, um, criminology was a new field in the 19th century. I mean, sociology, and there was there was an idea that any sort of sociopathic or violent behavior that you know threatens the well-being of polite society, we can master it somehow mm -hmm. if we apply the right modes of study and repression to it. Particularly scientific modes of study. Yeah. So you start to see that through science, we are going to, uh, like I said, make heaven on earth. So you'll start to notice that everything becomes scientific. So we now have political science, mm -hmm. right? And so through the study of political science, through the redrawing of the map, through through uh, diplomacy, we're going to have world peace. They really did believe they had yeah. fixed it. They, they had achieved world peace. And of course, you know, the irony is we know not just mm -hmm. one, but two world wars are going to break out as a result of that. You also start to see the science of economics, yeah. Right. A lot of things start calling themselves sciences, mm -hmm. which had been arts previously or not yes. even really academic, like economics. No one studied economics academically in the 17th or the 18th mm -hmm. century. Um, uh, history, frankly, I mean, history was long understood as one of the arts. Mm -hmm. um, but in the 19th century with the rise, it was I mean, to some degree in England, but um, probably even more so in Germany. Um, the idea that history can be taught with the same kind of method methodological precision that you teach chemistry or biology. And I think we see that in the study of theology as well, right? The German higher oh, critics start to come yeah, out the, of this the, time. Yeah, the Tübingen school of, uh, yeah, of higher criticism and, um, yeah, all that, all products of the same mm -hmm. kind of... So, so having a very like scientific formulaic approach to things and really believing that through quote scientific rigor, we can master these things. So, you know, through, through the study of economics, we are going to, you know, get rid of poverty. Mm -hmm. We're going to get rid of war, crime, um, disease. And they really did think they were on the brink of that. And then of course, all hell breaks loose. I was, there's a, um, like all of this, I think, you could kind of get a taste of there's a five page passage in Thomas Macaulay's History of England, which is a bestseller at this time. It outsold most of the novels that were big titles in this era. So in the 1840s, 1850s, Thomas Macaulay, who is a member of the Liberal Party, he's a politician, also a man of letters, a trained historian. He early in his book describes the same small English town nowadays, he's writing the 1840s versus 200 years ago, you know, the, of you know, the time of King Charles I and Cromwell. And he said, you would have had mud streets then. Now you have paved streets. You would have had no light posts then. Now you have light posts. If you had been walking out late at night, you would have been in fear of footpads or highwaymen. Nowadays, we have a police force to make sure that the, you know, so he enumerates all the different features of the towns and describes how all of them are improved. It's kind of funny. I mean, he says unironically at one point that we have factories here now, which are, you know, productive of all kinds of wealth. And you kind of ask, well, what about like the manual workers? <laughs> the you know, children and, dying in right, the factories. Children, yeah. yeah again, but like the, these things are at the same time, though, it's, it's a powerful piece of historical rhetoric where he and, and again, you could say he's stacking the deck in favor of modernity, which he is, but it's still kind of intoxicating. And if you were living in if you were a middle class person living in, you know, 1840s, 1850s London, you might 
um, you might easily be deceived into thinking that, yeah, you were about as close to heaven as Earth could get. So then World War I breaks out, which was the worst war that the globe had ever seen. And uh, it was just a conflagration of the all the worst things happening at the same time. So you still got 19th century political strategy, mm -hmm. right, where we're just going to line up against each other, but now you've got modern weapons. Mm -hmm. And so they're just mowing each other down. Uh, we have mass death in a way that no one had ever seen before, you know, mustard gas, flamethrowers. Um, planes, tanks. Planes, tanks, you know. all, all of it, um, trench warfare. And so... To say that that popped the bubble of optimism is such an understatement. It was like despair came over the globe after that. Like, like you have we well, have post traumatic stress for the first time, which we'll talk about that because Dorothy Sayers actually deals with that. Um, you've got just all these people. Well, first of all, you got a huge amount of people dead, right? Um, and so, so that loss is tremendous. But then you've got the survivors walking around that are that are maimed in this way that no one ever saw before. So, like, it's this constant reminder of what we had done to each other, and and it really was like with the snap of a finger, feeling like we've got heaven on earth to thinking this is hell, this is hell. And it had just really, I'm struggling with words, but here, I mean, honestly, we don't have the words for what happened to them. Um, one of the things I think you have to think about is that you can only understand the Roaring Twenties in the context of the despair created by World War I. Because all of a sudden, it's like, what, what, what are we doing here? We're not building anything. Life is not meaningless. We're not, I mean, not, life is not meaningful. We're not achieving anything. Uh, we have all these traditions and all these old ways, and look where it's got us. Look where it's got us. Um, and Lewis and Tolkien, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, who were both veterans and survivors of the war barely both of them um got injured and, and got out that way but and, and both of them suffered tremendous loss of of their friends dying but they they talk about in their life the despair that everybody had like they were one of the few people who held on to their belief in tradition and their belief in religion when everybody around them was saying every everything's pointless and and just falling into this despair and so you have that, and then you also have the world radically changing after the war in terms of the ramping up of the technology. So we are in a we are in an intense time. I mean, I actually just read two books back to back on the difference in millennials versus Gen Z because of the age of the cell phone. Okay, and there is a divided mark there, and there is a huge generation gap. Actually, there's a generation gap. I have three children. There's a generation gap between my children over mm -hmm. that. Um, and and you know everything those books said totally totally rang true. But there but there's a much more severe version of that going on after World War One when you hit the 1920s. And so we think about the lost generation. We think about um, the flappers and the jazz age. That happens because everybody loses their mind in and, World War One. And if I could interject, I I think that's also I mean, and parents and children I mean have never seen eye to eye since. Probably, you know, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. I'm, I'm guessing there was probably like a pop cultural divide there too. I'm, I'm just speculating here. But uh, um, with the coming of the jazz age in mm -hmm. the 1920s, I think that's really the first time where you have a part of the market and, you know, the ad business and popular culture, which is consciously seeking out youth dollars yep. and you're like where – you have distinctly different types of music, which appeal to old and young people. Um, I mean, also the, just the way that, uh, I mean, you just think of the way like women say. In okay, that well, I actually read a whole bunch about this. This mm -hmm. is one of my areas that I'm quite interested in. So the 1920s is the first time ever in the history of the world you have a generation gap. That's, yeah, kind of what I'm, yeah. Ever. It's exactly. fascinating. So yes, all this stuff is marketed to kids. So this is the first time kids, teenagers have their own way of dress their own hair, their own slang, um, their own music that they listen to, their own youth culture. Uh, the car plays into this. The, the, the advent of telephone culture plays into this. Um, the, bicy well, the bicycle is a generation old at this point, but that was seen as a liberating and in some ways a very dangerous device. Very dangerous. Or, yeah. Okay, so the, the big deal with the generation gap is that before this time, the goal of a child was to grow into an adult. 
and you looked at the adults and you wanted to be like them, right? And and your adults, the adults knew how to live and make their way in the world in a way in which they could advise you. Once you get to the 1920s and the world is changing so fast and the generation gap, now you have like, well, you have the advent of adolescence, which also did not exist before that. And so you've got this youth period being extended for longer and longer. And here we are where we now say you're still your teenager till you're yeah, 30. The age of the yeah. 40 year old man who plays video. Exactly. So we, we, we've pulled it out even further. But once you have different ways of talking, you know, just a whole different youth culture. And, and then, of course, combined with, yeah, I know there's so many different parts to this and I'm trying to summarize, but it combines with a rapidly changing world because of technology so that the parents actually no longer can teach the younger generation, which we have that now because of technology as well, where the kids know how to handle themselves in the new technological age better than the older generation. So it it, it undermines the idea that the elders of the town have wisdom to share. Uh, and it just really starts to fragment the family in a whole new way. The the um the book uh, Cheaper by the Dozen I think uh, deals with that right where the daughters want to cut their hair, and the the parents don't want them to. When is that written? Nineteen twenties. Is that really that mm-hmm. old? Wow. Yep. Um, the telephone, the advent of the telephone, reg- radically changes things. Uh, I remember reading a book about this. This is fascinating to me. So you end up with teen dating culture because of the telephone. Okay, so you've got you've got this. Oh, I know, man. I'm like excited now. I'm talking about my favorite stuff here. But in the 19th century, you had a courtship culture, uh-huh. and and going into the 20th century, that still that still was the case where you know you you don't step out with a young man without a chaperone, but because of the telephone, you could be having a private conversation with a member of the opposite sex, but you're in you're not in the same room with them. You're in the room with your family, and so. Like, the, you know, same thing that's happened with cell phones and selfies and sexting and all the things, right? Like, you don't realize this is going on with your child right in front of you because it seems like, no, they're in the room with me. They're safe, right? So everything just starts to change super, super fast. Another thing that we can't, I, I cannot wrap my head around this, how fast women's fashions changed. So you go from... More rapidly than men's, I think. Way more. Well, it's yeah. part of the whole women's liberation thing that happened. Mm-hmm. So... You've got corsets, you've got long dresses that go to the floor because you can't show a woman's ankle, which, you know, women are always tripping over them. You've got the high necklines, everything's covered, long hair that's up because wearing your hair down was something that prostitutes did. So uh, respectable women always wore their hair up. Um, you've, you've got these just very strict codes of dress. And then like, again, snap the fingers. It's 1920s, you got the flappers look. You've got basically mini skirts, right? So you've got no corsets. You've got um, very clingy fabrics, which are showing a woman's body in, in a way that's never been done before. Uh, you've got exposed shoulders during the day. You've got dresses over the knee. You've got women cutting their hair and wearing their hair down and short like a boy. You've got faces being painted, makeup. I was going to say, because in the most mm-hmm. most of the 19th century women, we were actually talking about yeah, this last did. night when watching a movie, um, women don't wear makeup, nope. respectable women don't wear They do not paint their faces. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now respectable women, well, quote unquote respectable, because you still, there's like this, this fight between the new world and the old world, which of course is, if you're paying attention, this relates to the novel, because this group in the jazz age in England comes to be known as the bright young things, which she does reference, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, so the world is just radically changing. And then we have the rise of advertising, which also plays into this into this book. And so um, actually, why you want to say what you said before before we put on the, the well, recording? The advertising industry, as we think of it, think of it is pretty new at this time. Um, I think it was in 18, I read in 1899, the first international, the first American advertising conglomerate with an international presence was founded. That was uh, J. Walter Thompson, um, which I think existed until fairly recently. Um, Anyway, and the ad industry is something that is omnipresent in the developed world and tends to be associated with Americanization uh, already at this point, and even more so after World War II, which is kind of getting ahead of ourselves here. Um, But uh, yeah, this... um, this new type of business dedicated to making people feel an itch to buy something that they didn't know existed before. Uh, This is a relatively new feature of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So this is also another one of my areas of 
hyper-focused interests is the rise of modern advertising. And the rise of modern advertising does happen in the 1920s. And I think it is completely related to this. Um, my husband can tell you listeners, he can verify this, that I collect advertisements from the 1920s and 30s. I'm utterly fascinated with the history of advertising to see how it changes. If you ever come to our home in our bathroom is a 1921 ad that um, is hanging in the bathroom and it's got a woman and she's advertising um, Cleopatra's Beauty Secret, which is olive oil. And the ad says, why fade at 30? Why fade at 30? Buy this beauty product and you can stay, you can stay young. Uh, that, that, the youth culture, the advertising, all of that. And I see a direct line between World War I and the birth of the advertising world. It's almost like... Something that just made me think oh, of, sorry, I'm cutting you off here, but um, sunbathing. That was also a new thing then. Well, no, you wanted to have very fair skin. Previously, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, if you look at the difference in bathing suits between the 19th century and 1920, again, you're seeing I mean, male and female fashion. bodies, but you're seeing yeah. bodies now and you never did before. So like ev everything's changed. Yep. Sexual mores are also changing and they changed before the 1960s in America. Oh, and when people talk about mixed bathing, uh, that was kind of yeah. scandalous. Yeah, like, at like, the beach. The, yeah, exactly. The, the same part of the beach being open to men and women at the same time. Because in the 19th century, I mean, yes, people went to the beach, but it was either in a family setting or men and women would go kind of separate from what they I They also had those things. Do you remember this? They they showed it in um, that Queen Victorian movie with uh, Judy Dench. The bathing. With with Mrs. Brown. Yes. Okay. I know. So it's, yes. They, they have that tent there's like a tent, you know what I'm talking about? You kind of, you, it's so like a you, tent on wheels. It's a kind tent of. on wheels yeah. and because you don't want to be seen in your bathing suit, uh, even in, in the Victorian age where a bathing suit is like a full on dress. Yeah. Okay. So you would get in this tent and then it would wheel you out into the ocean. And once you were all the way in the water with the tent, then you could swim out and just have your head shown. And that was modest swimming. Yeah. So I'm thinking the swimming in a dress. Okay. Really? Surprise. I've never done this, but do you hey. think like any women died because of... Oh, no question. The women died because of fashion all the time. Their dresses were getting caught on fire. That was another big yeah, thing. Yeah, right. So I'm not sitting here saying we need to be going back to the Victorian age. Don't, don't hear me say that. What I'm trying to say is the world radically changed almost overnight. Almost overnight. And we get dominated by this youth culture. And so I think the rise of advertising is connected to this in a couple of interesting ways. One, I think when you're filled with this despair and life feels meaningless and, and what is the point of building anything, building a life? Like nothing means anything because we're all just going to blow each other up anyway, which of course they do. They break Another war is going to break out in 20 years. But the answer sort of becomes, you know what will make you feel better? Buy something, which I'm saying we still have that, right? Everybody at home is like, oh my goodness, that's exactly what we do right now. You're feeling bored. You're feeling uh, like you're you know, anxious, despairing, whatever. Buy something. That'll cheer you up. So I put Aldous Huxley's Brave New World in this context, right? And, and what, what do you see there? You see in Brave New World, in this meaningless world, you got you to gotta buy something, right? So buy, 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 buy. Play, 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 play. Um, quote, unquote, free love. Uh, it's all the things that happen in the culture after World War II. I'm sorry, World War I, in between, in between the two worlds. World War II creates a different sort of response. Um, Aldous Huxley was seen at this time as being kind of one of the literary voices of the bright young things. Uh, yep, um, I can see that. Yeah. I can see that. Okay, so I'll get to the bright young things in a minute. So interestingly enough, and I've actually given a few conference talks on this, when you're suddenly confronted with nothing means anything and you're, you have this just horrible existential despair, which some people are going to deal with by becoming members of the bright young things and drugs and sex and partying, because if life doesn't mean anything, let's party, right? Um, but another thing that happened was this almost obsessive need to bring order to chaos, Right. So everything's blown up. Everything's in fragments. But we got to put these fragments together. They've got to mean something. Surely, surely there's order in this insane world. And so this is quite fascinating to me that you see a number of things pop up in popularity all at the same time. One, jigsaw puzzles. Two, crossword puzzles. Three, detective novels. 
Isn't that fascinating? I was going to say totalitarian politics also. That's another way of bringing order to well, you're not, you're, of, Well, you're not wrong. You thought of better things. I was thinking of yeah. better things, but you're, but you're not wrong. And, and we'll, we can talk about that as well. That, uh, I think that that's how you end up with a totalitarian leader is because you're so desperate oh, yeah, to have order offered that you'll take even bad order. I talk about this in my modern history class. I mean, if you don't have World War One, you would not have had... I mean, I'm not saying you wouldn't have had totalitarianism in some shape, but you wouldn't have had totalitarian communism in Russia, Nazism in Germany, fascism in Italy, it wouldn't have taken the same form. It or and probably wouldn't have existed in this in those places either. So yeah. So so out of that same world with where everyone's obsessively doing jigsaw puzzles and crossword puzzles, again, just trying to bring order to chaos, right? Uh, taking all the bits and pieces and putting them into something that makes sense. That is when the Golden Age detective novel is born. Uh, and you get the queens of crime. You get Dorothy Sayers, Agatha Christie, Marjorie Allingham, and Nio Marsh. Now, last week, I played a best of episode for you guys, the importance of the detective novel, because I didn't want to have to repeat all of this stuff today. Um, so I've, you, can, you can hear my, my whole big spiel about that in, in, in the episode that played last week. Um, but Sayers is absolutely, absolutely in here. Um, one, of the, one of the top ones... Um, and she starts writing her Lord Peter novel. So Sayers, Sayers is one of these just rare minds, one of these just absolutely brilliant people. Uh, had she been a man, she would have been an academic. But because she was a woman, that avenue was close to her. She was essentially homeschooled, just given access to her parents' library. Um, she knew multiple languages. She goes to Oxford. She attends classes there. She goes at a time when women can't be granted a degree. Um. She graduates, and you know what is she going to do? What is she going to do? She's this brilliant woman. She's going to later go on to um, translate the Divine Comedy, um, translate the Song of Roland, you know, give us all this amazing stuff. In, in so many ways, she's like the female C.S. Lewis. She's writing fiction. She's writing up um, Christian apologetics. She's uh, doing academic work. Uh, you know, just a tremendous, tremendous mind. Um, but she's got to pay the bills. <laughs> She's got to support herself. I mean, this is this is of course another thing that we see after World War One is women entering the workforce, um, and and uh, it's going to take a long time before that's more accepted. And World War Two will be a big part of that as the men are gone. Um, I mean, a huge amount. I mean, before anybody's like, "Whoa, feminism!" I mean, men are dead. <laughs> All these men are dead, and so there's a need for more workers, and so women start to take those jobs. Um, particularly offish jobs. So in 1922, this powerhouse of a mind, um, you know, who who becomes later in her life very, very good friends with C.S. Lewis. We have a whole podcast episode on their friendship. Uh, and she's in so many ways an honorary inkling, but she's got to pay the bills as a single broad in England in the post-war world. And so in 1922, she takes a job at S.H. Benson's which is Britain's largest ad agency. And she works there from 1922 to 1929. So really, she's there at the beginning of modern advertising. So she's a best-selling author. Not yet. The, okay, she's, not yet. So she's writing the Lord Peter novels on the side, and she's going to quit in 1929 because now she's making enough money as a writer that she that she can quit. But yes, so the detective novels are the side gig. Mm. So it's right after she quits that she writes... That she writes this novel, which is which is quite interesting. Um, she, uh, well, yeah. So where this book fits in is this is going to be. She writes this one right after Have His Carcass, which is the second Harriet Vane book. So she's introduced Harriet and Lord Peter's um, storyline. She was working on the Nine Tailors, which a lot of people think is her best work. I, it's not my favorite, um, but a lot of a lot of people think it's certainly one of her best. She was working on the Nine Tailors. That's the one with Campanology, the yeah. Bells. Mm -hmm. um, she was having a hard time with that one, so she put that one on the back burner, and she she and she just churned out this one really really fast because she knows all about advertising, right? So she churns out this one really fast, and then um, so then Nine Tailors gets published right right after that. Um, but she was really good as a copywriter, actually. So she had a couple of really really um important campaigns one was the coleman mustard campaign which i think gets getting referenced a few times in here it's like some kind of mustard club thing but her big big one her big claim to fame that everybody at home is going to know is that she was the copywriter for the famous guinness ads 
uh, with the toucan. And I got to tell you the story about the ad here. This is a true story. I want to tell you this. You're going to say, okay, that's why she's making all these snarky comments in here about the demands of customers, right? The, 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 the companies come in and they put these insane parameters and demands on the copywriters. Like, this is the ad I want, okay? So this really happened with Guinness. No, get close to the microphone because I want to hear your response when I tell you this. So Guinness beer, right? Okay. So the Guinness execs come in, they sit down with Sayers and the other people on the ad team, and they want to hire Benson's for a, an expansive uh, ad campaign. And they have two requirements. One, it needs to be family friendly. Two, it can't ever say the word beer. Is a concession to the teetotalers, like the, um, the the abstinence people? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think Guinness, Guinness. Well, okay, it makes sense because Guinness really is a family company. Yeah. It is a family company. Um, they were conservative, mm -hmm. uh, and also Guinness is not. I mean, we're American, so we think of beer as something you you know you, you drink beer to you know feel a buzz. But in Ireland, Guinness really is a health drink. It's full of B vitamins. Um. I'm well aware that doctors used to tell pregnant women to drink Guinness beer because it had oh. so much B vitamins. I have friends from Ireland who refer to Guinness beer as a lady's drink. Um, so I, I think they they did. You're laughing. They I think they did. I th I think they were serious that 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 oh. we have a family friendly product here and we don't wow. we don't want you to push the alcohol angle. We want we want you to push the family friendly um, angle. So she did. Dorothy and 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 gang successfully did this, so they came up. This with, could be a movie by itself. It really yeah. could. Well, I have often asked myself why there is no movie about Dorothy Sayers. I mean, when Agatha Christie went missing, the newspapers went to Dorothy Sayers and asked her to solve the and crime. There's a movie about the Agatha Christie yeah, was yeah, missing. That part, you but, know, I, I know. So I have this yeah. whole idea that the movie I want to see really, someone needs to write this for me. I. And so, so Dorothy Sayers goes and she looks at the clues and she goes to the crime scene and she she writes up this thing and ultimately says, like, I don't know what happened to Agatha Christie. But in my imagination, Dorothy Sayers does solve the crime. She does figure out what happened to, to Agatha Christie, but she just lies to the newspapers to protect her. So that's that's how it worked out in my imagination. That's the movie that's I would like to idea. see. Isn't that a great idea for a movie? I, I So, you know, she and Agatha Christie go on some adventure together. That That's how it worked out in my mind. But anyway, I digress. So the ad campaign... So so it could be a mystery, but also Thelma and Louise. Oh my gosh, now I love it. Except they wouldn't drive into the Grand Canyon. No. Yeah. No. It would end more happily. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh this, this sounds sellable to me. Oh, right. Two 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 awesome broads. I mean, come on. All right. So here's the ad campaign they came up with Guinness that everybody knows. Um they came up with the zoo animals idea. So the cartoon cartoon zoo animals. You can you can find they still make the posters of them because this was a very, very famous ad campaign. None of them say the word beer in any of the ads. And they have all of the um, are the cartoon zoo animals. And Dorothy Sayers worked on the Guinness toucan. We've all seen the Guinness toucan ads. So Dorothy Sayers, copywriter, wrote this ad. Here's what, here's what she wrote. And friends, if any of you find a poster of this somewhere, I have been looking for a vintage poster of this for so long and cannot find it. So if anybody finds a poster of this particular thing, um, please send it to me. But here's, here's what she wrote. So the ad is the toucan, right? The cartoon toucan. And this, the copy says, if he can say as you can, Guinness is good for you. How grand to be a toucan. Just think what toucan do. That's charming. <laughs> So yes, she was part of the Drink Guinness, It's Good For You ad campaign. I love that. I love that. She also coined this phrase in this book. So we read it. Remember when Lord Peter says, it pays to advertise? No. That is the first time that was That's ever said. Time. She coined that phrase. Isn't that great? Huh. She's so great. She's so great. I love her. All right. So she starts working on this book, placing it in an ad campaign. And she had an interesting goal for this. So one of the criticisms about detective novels, and if you read a lot of them, and I do, this is, this is not an unwarranted criticism, that most of them are so focused on the puzzle that you don't see a ton of character development and there's not like a whole lot else going on. Some of, the, some of them are better at this than others. Um, but Agatha Christie, who is a, I mean, a queen through and through, 
she's uneven. Like she turns out so many books. There are definitely some where you're like, eh, this is, you know, this is like doing a crossword puzzle. This wasn't, there wasn't much to this. And one of the things I've always loved about Dorothy Sayers is her novels are much more literary. They're deliberate works of art. Deliberate works of yeah. art. That's right. And Murder Must Advertise was the first time she did that. So sometimes people will hear me talking about how much I love these books, and then they'll go and they'll read the first one and be like, why do you love these books? Well, the first one's not very good. Even she didn't think it was very good. It's very formulaic, very much just, you know, not a lot of character development. It's not not terribly interesting in any way. And so she decides to start breaking some of the detection rules. Um, one of the rules is that you don't introduce a love interest and she introduces a love interest and she wants Peter to grow up and she wants to change. Um, in fact, it was when she introduced the love interest, Harriet Vane, that she realized she had a problem because Lord Peter was not a worthy man for this woman. And so she had to write him over the next few books and, and change him and make him somebody who would be worthy of her. And so you you never see this with Hercule Poirot. And I love Agatha Christie, don't get me wrong, but Hercule Poirot does not develop. He does not develop. He does not evolve. He's not, he doesn't, he's not a different kind of man at the end of this books as he is at the beginning. He's he's the detective. But Lord Peter does. He grows, he changes, um, and he becomes a, a man wor worthy of Harriet. Uh, but but this book, so she had already, so two books earlier with Strong Poison, she had already kind of changed the rules and and introduced a love interest, which had very much displeased Agatha Christie because Sayers broke the rules. Um, and with this book, she further uh, wanted to break the rules. So here's a quote she has in another essay where she talks about what she was trying to do here. So she's talking about how she she wants to write a novel of manners. She wants to elevate the detective novel. She doesn't want it to just be a puzzle, but she wants it to be like a real, like you say, work of art, a real, uh, how would you dis how would you define a novel of manners? Uh, a novel dedicated to examining, uh, displaying and examining the social customs and mores of the society in which that's it's right set. yeah sorry that was off yeah. the top of my head that's not it's a good one like and, and that's what we see in this jane austen a, writes novels jane austen manners. writes novels of manners lots of yeah lots of observations all of writes novels yes manners. lots of observations about the way real people live yeah. and what their society is really like so she's she, she wants to do that she says i think the first real attempt at fusing the two kinds of novels meaning the the puzzle detective novel and the novel of manners was made in murder must advertise in which, for the first time, the criticism of life was not relegated to incidental observations and character sketches, but was actually part of the plot as it ought to be. Now, you were just saying before we started the podcast how much you were enjoying these comments on life she was giving. Probably more than uh, in the, this is only the second Dorothy Sayers mystery of open, but yeah, I enjoy that side of her writing perhaps even more than the mystery proper. Oh, well, me too. Me too. For for me, Agatha Christie. Really witty too. She's so witty. Yeah. She's so witty. I want to I want to look at some of those passages in a second, but for me, Agatha Christie, no one beats her for pure puzzle. Mm -hmm. She's the queen of the puzzle. Um, but Dorothy Sayers is different. I've I've never found the mystery to be the most interesting thing of her writing. It's it's all the other things, which is why I can read them over and over. Uh, but, but because of all of that. Um, so, yes, we should say that uh, my dear husband here does not share his wife's great love of the detective novel, but I've sort of pushed them. I bullied you into them. <laughs> and so you read you read one about a year ago. Which one did you read? I read The Unpleasantness at the Bologna Club. Yes. And you, I had such a good time watching you read that because you were taking it into bed with you. You were reading it at night and you kept telling me how much you loved it. Yeah, and she, well, she kind of does something similar here, but... Um, in the Bologna Club, it's not obvious that a murder has occurred. When, right, when there's the just a suspicious found. death. It, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a potentially suspicious death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you made me so happy because you you were saying I think I'm going to recommend this to my brother, and I really wanted you to read this one. I, this one's the one I have been desperate for you to read because I think this one as Agatha Christie meets Evil and Wa. Yes, uh, even the style is um, the kind of hectic bunch of young people being busy uh and uh not not fully realizing what a miserable world they live in mm -hmm. because it's you know glamorous and uh a certain amount of money is you know circulating here and uh it's a 
fun place to pursue fun, to pursue hedonism. Very, very Evelyn Waugh. And Evelyn Waugh also wrote about the bright young things. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he was one of them and he wrote about them. And then he went on to become kind of a uber conservative old man who despised everything new, which is kind of strange. But, but yeah. The Johnny Rotten of his age. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah, in some ways. If you don't get that joke, Johnny Rotten was a punk rock singer in the 1970s for the group The Sex Pistols, who was all about anarchy. And now as an old man, he is completely pro-monarchist and one is one of the great conservatives of England. I, it's fascinating, just absolutely fascinating to watch punk rockers grow up. Um, yeah, so we all we see a lot of development of the character of of lord peter and i was so pleased i didn't say a word to you and i was so pleased when you came to me about two chapters in and said this it's supposed to be obvious that this guy is lord peter in disguise right i was so glad you caught that yeah i i, I don't pick up on things like that necessarily quickly i i don't necessarily have a firm grasp of the obvious but this is this is really obvious. Well, I was I felt very affirmed when you said that because years and years and years ago I had said it's Lord Peter and somebody got really mad at me and said I had spoiled it. No, and I, I thought it's it's obvious. Page one. Thank and, you. And she even she even says that the new guy at the office is a mix of uh Bertie Wooster and um she, she named some actor. I had to look him up, but he he played the stupid aristocrat in spats type roles mm -hmm. a lot. So he the again, Scarlet Pimpernel. Yeah, that, that kind of guy. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um so yeah, oh. th that's not supposed to come as a big surprise. All right. So, so Lord Peter is in disguise here. He's going to be in disguise really all, all the time. It's going to be a number of disguises because he's also in the Harlequin later on. And we'll, we'll get to that. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that she keeps saying Bertie Wooster, Bertie Wooster, Bertie Wooster, P.G. Woodhouse. Um, we don't see a ton of bunter, which is um, Lord Peter's valet here. No, that surprised me. I was, um, yeah. But, um, well, I guess that I mean, we're going to stick Bunter in the in the ad agency. Sure. Uh, so Bunter doesn't make a big appearance here. Uh, but the but in all the other books, Lord Peter is with a manservant. And this is quite intentionally based on Jeeves and Bertie Wooster. But she does something interesting with it because Lord Peter acting like an idiot fop, that's a disguise. Mm -hmm. That's the Bertie Wooster disguise. And he... he in, in the other books, he's able to, this one's different, but in the other books, he's able to use that to disarm people. Like they just always underestimate they tell him. More him than they, yeah, because they're not guarded. Because yeah. he's playing like he's a fop. But it, when you read all of the books, you find out that everything about this is a disguise. And um, and that he has in common with a lot of detectives. But yes. Like Poirot is also, I mean, he's the funny little foreigner who mm -hmm. fusses about everything and people kind of dismiss him because of that right right um but you find out that lord peter is a world war one veteran and you you actually do over the course of the series get the whole story and bunter saved his life and all these other things um but he has horrific um what they would call shell-shocked back then post-traumatic stress um and in some of the books he actually does have breakdowns he has ptsd breakdowns um, I love that she deals with that. And so you find out, I think it's in, um, I want to say it's in some short stories. It's a, it's a, it's something that his uncle is talking about. So his uncle tells the story of how Peter was one of these sufferers of the war who was just like toast mentally. He, 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 he couldn't stop crying. He was depressed and he was just a mess and, and he could not get his act together. And so his uncle kind of talks to him and says, y you've got to put this behind you. You know, you you're young and you have a life to live and, you know, kind of gives him this pep talk. And so what Peter does is then put on this character of mm -hmm. Lord Peter Whimsy. And it's so that he can cope with his own PTSD. So he's he's kind of playing a part all the time. And you see different, I don't want to give too much away for later books, but, you know, it, it comes through at different times. But, but. When he comes across very deliberately like frivolous and silly and I'm just a rich playboy, that's the, he put that act on to to be able to function in, in his state of, you know, war wounds. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but yeah, I love him. So so that was that when when he's being described as an old Etonian and Bertie Worcester, this is this is Lord Peter in and, disguise. And he doesn't change. Well, I mean, he does change his name, but his 
it's his middle name. Is, yeah, and is it pronounced death like okay. it looks or is it beast? Oh, boy, do I have so much information. I might have something to you say. might have something to say about that. Okay, well, first of all, before we get to that, I just got to say, the name of the first chapter makes me smile so much, right? So the first chapter is Death Comes to Pym's Publicity, which I realized was that P.D. James is Death Comes to Pimberley mm -hmm. is riffing off of this, which is a very golden age detective novel thing to do. The more that I read of them, the more delighted I am because they're always referencing each other. Like the, like if you read Anthony Barkley or Marjorie Allingham, they're always in there saying, who do you think you are, Lord Peter Whimsey? Like they're, they're always referencing each other. So I love that. Death Comes to Pim's Publicity. And it's also an homage to P.G. Woodhouse because Pim, the name, I mean, it's not an impossible name. You could find real living people, but... Um, that would have conjured up in 1933 uh, the character um, is Lucius Pym, who's one of the mainstays in the Woodhouse canon. Oh, I didn't catch that. She yeah. has a lot of P.G. Woodhouse references. I'm almost positive that. Say at some point I read this that P.G. Woodhouse was a fan of Sayers. Hmm. I believe that's true. But we also have a pun here because death comes to Pym's publicity and it's it's the guy, death breed him, but it's also, you know, someone died. So So yeah. we've got the double mark there. All right. So what's the deal with a name death? So I did some research on this. Uh, usually it's pronounced um, either death or dayoth, but Peter is going to say in this book it's pronounced death like breath. And I think I think Peter's just being Peter. I, I think he's playing it up, but that's not how other people would have pronounced it. So there's a whole bunch of theories about where it came from. Um, my favorite theory, though, is that this goes back to the Middle Ages, the medieval mystery plays, which were allegories. The character who played Death, that he started to be called Death. And so that becomes a name that way. Oh, I didn't know that. No, isn't that interesting? Wow. Yeah. Um, and Breeden means sword. So I think that fits with the knight errant oh. idea, right? Um, so he's Lord Peter Death Breeden, Breeden, right? I think it's Breeden, whimsy. So he's got his he's got his sword there. I love that so much. Um, I don't even know what language would Breeden be sword in. Uh, is it Anglo-Saxon? It could be. I mean, it's, I need, it's I need a language I don't know. Evidently, I need to yeah. look it up. I need to look that one up. Um, all right. Well, let's jump in. So, so we have our our, our man in disguise, and you came to me when you started reading, it and you said. I just love how well she's setting this novel up. The first chapter is really confusing. I mean, it's simply from the sheer number of characters who are introduced okay. in it. So we have all these names to keep track of, and it's a busy day at the office. There's a new guy at the office. Um, just the It's an atmosphere of rush, and your eye doesn't pause on anything in particular. At least mine didn't, and I think she's trying. Oh to no, that's that. it's brilliant, right? She's she's burying you in the details, mm -hmm. and that, of course, is what they do. They yeah. they it's almost like a squid releasing. Right, a, you know, right, you know. and and they're just going to overwhelm you in details so that they don't telegraph the the, the you know who who the who the criminal is. Um, and I think in the last episode, if you listen to that one, I did talk about how all detective novels start off with disorienting you mm -hmm. um, because the detective comes in just as disoriented. And it's just like, think of it like you just opened a puzzle box, right? And you dumped out all the puzzle pieces. That's for me. And I love puzzles. That's a very overwhelming moment, right? Just all these pieces. And how am I going to put all this together? And, and that's what, that's what you're walking into at the beginning of a detective novel. All of these pieces, everything's upside down and, and confused. Um, I love her descriptions of the ad age is frantic, chaotic. It's so like modern in every way. You, it, it, I kind of here. Here's an analogy. Actually, as a lawyer's daughter, you might appreciate this. So it's kind of like, I mean, since the rules of the detective club stipulate, club club stipulate that you have to share the evidence. There has to be a disclosure of the clues that would allow a reader to piece it together himself, right? So is it kind of like? disclosure in a trial where a good defense attorney say might overwhelm the that's exactly yeah overwhelm the when they give you five thousand documents uh -huh. to work through that's and exactly you have a month right. before trial it's or something to like hide that. it in plain yeah. sight no yeah. that's that's exactly right that's that's okay. that's very good that's very well said um 
So what he's referring to, the rules, the detection club was a real actual club of all the golden age detective novelists. And they took turns being president and Ronald Knox, um, who, you know, detective novelist and also Catholic priest, um, he wrote up a set of rules for the detection club. Now, there's a lot of debate about what, whether or not those were kind of tongue in cheek rules, but nonetheless, they were the rules. And but one of their I think at the beginning of the meetings, there's a great picture of Dorothy Sayers um, as president, like in a black robe, and she's got like a skull and candlesticks. It's very, you know, like they're playing the game Clue, you know. But um, they all had to take this oath as detective novelists, and one of them was what Mr. Banks was just saying, this fair play, that um, it's cheating in a detective novel if he picks up a piece of paper, reads some clue, puts it in his pocket, and they don't tell the reader. That that in the in the spirit of fair play, a true fair play, a true golden age detective novel is going to give you all the clues to solve it. Um, and they they get very I mean, nobody's better than Agatha Christie for the Mr. X. You know, she when you know who did it and you go back and you read it, you just have to laugh because she just she just puts it right up in your face and you still don't get it because she's so good. Um, but, you know. Occasionally, I'll hear complaints about these novels, and I'll think, "Oh, you don't, you don't understand how they work." So, usually, golden age detective novels are pretty cozy; they don't have a lot of graphic violence, but sometimes they do. And again, this was very deliberate in the detection club because they know that if there's like a detailed description of a dead body or something gross, that the readers are not going to read that very carefully; they're going to skim over just read it fast and that almost always in those moments is when they are putting a vital clue that they know you're just going to look away from um so that's that's fantastic but speaking of dorothy sayers wit witticisms would you read the author's note at the beginning of the book because this really made me chuckle. Yes, i like this author's note i do not suppose that there is a more harmless and law-abiding set of people in the world than the advertising experts of great britain the idea that any crime could possibly be perpetrated on advertising premises is one that could occur only to the ill-regulated fancy of a detective novelist trained to fasten the guilt upon the, all caps, most unlikely person. If in the course of this fantasy I have unintentionally used a name or slogan suggestive of any existing person, firm, or commodity, it is by sheer accident and is not intended to cast the slightest reflection upon any actual commodity, firm, or person. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Sarcastically covering our bases here to exactly. make sure that we don't get uh, sued. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. All right. So, so we start off and we're being introduced to our cast of characters and we have a, a death, but we don't. I mean, we don't even know if it's mysterious. We find it's out later death that... Death by misadventure, as they would describe Exactly. It. And and we find out, you know, in, in the chapters that we read, that uh, it was uh, the deceased sister who uh, contacted the Mr. Pym, and Mr. Pym then contacts Lord Peter. Uh, so Lord Peter is a well-known amateur detective, and his brother-in-law is... Um, uh, an actual policeman. Mm -hmm. And and Lord Peter has a good relationship with the police. It's not like... Um, Sherlock Holmes and Lestrade. Uh, that tends to be one of the features of the Golden Age detective novel is that they have friendly relationships with the police mm -hmm. and Scotland Yard. Um, okay. Uh, we also had a lot of poems here. So this is a poem by Walter de la Mare. This one. Did you recognize that one? The Actually, Bre I Bre did not. I thought that was just something she was making up. Of. So I did too until, uh, until Emily Rabel messaged me and said it was a Walter Dillon. God bless Emily Rabel. Yep. Wow. And then I looked I, it up no, and it is, it I've is. Read, I, honestly, I think I've read most of what Delamere wrote and I didn't recognize it. Well, it's filled with references. We had a Macbeth reference. Mm -hmm. um, it's Now he's not, he's pretending to be somebody else here. So he's not doing his Lord Peter thing where he's always quoting in Latin or French, but there's a lot of Latin and French in here, in her books typically. Uh, I, I, I love him. I love Lord Peter so much because he's so funny. He's so funny, uh, you know, and so all of his crazy ads that he's coming up with and he's doing his best, poor thing. Um, so we find also, that it's, it's kind of a Bertie Wooster like situation, just sort of to casually take a job at an advertising agency, even though, you know, you don't really have to work for a living. And his it's, sister's Bertie will, teasing Bertie will like write the occasional shallow article for his aunt's what's his aunt's ridiculous magazine? Milady's Boudoir. Milady's Boudoir. Like, you know, occasionally dabble with work. It's like, oh, yeah, see how the great unwashed, you know, uh, get along and that kind of thing. 
um, you know. When Lord Peter tells his sister that's the first money he's ever earned in his life. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly the kind of thing Bertie Wooster would say. Oh, wow, that's what a paycheck is. So it was really funny that you came to me when you were reading and you said, uh, did we meet Chekhov's staircase? I want you to look at what I actually wrote in the margin. She wrote Chekhov's staircase. <laughs> and if, if anyone's not familiar with that expression, so Anton Chekhov, the great Russian short story writer and playwright, um, once stated as a just kind of a maxim of storytelling, if you introduce something into the story, a, a plot element justified by actually giving it some use. So uh, he, um, it, it's Chekhov's gun is the uh, uh, original form of it. He said, um, if you introduce a rifle in chapter, or excuse me, in act one of a play, by the end of act five, it has to go off. And there actually is one of his plays where that literally happens. Um, yeah. My middle school students in particular love guessing what Chekhov is going to, Chekhov's asthma inhaler. Like we, we, we always, we're always guessing what the Chekhov thing is in the stories that we read. Some of my favorite, favorite parts of this book um, and, and the beginning chapter has been most of their time in the ad executive. We do get introduced to the bright young things, but that's going to become a, a bigger thing. The dope trade is going to become a bigger thing later in the book, but I love all of the comments about advertising and language, playing with language, right? Suggesting things without saying it, because if you if you make an actual claim, then you can, that's actionable, right? Because um, then that's false advertising. So you have to suggest things. Like, look at this um, about the fake the fake margarine, the fake butter, the fake yeah. mar margarine. Okay, which again, that was another a war product. This is a war product. Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis was very concerned that children growing up in the war era would never know what butter was, and that actually would prefer margarine. Uh, and did you know that in at this time, I think margarine, it didn't actually look like butter. It was, um, I, I, the original margarine looked more like um, Vaseline. Oh, gross. Okay, so, they, yeah. so they're advertising yeah. this. Dairy feels green, quote, unquote, green pastures margarine. Okay, I love this. They like a cow in the picture. Why? Is it made of cow fat? Well, I dare say it is, but you mustn't say so. People wouldn't like the idea. The picture of the cow suggests the taste of butter, that's all. And the name Green Pastures suggests cows, you see. <laughs> so then they keep going and Lord Peter is coming up with all these slogans, okay? Bigger and better, value for money. No, bigger and butter, value for money. You'd better, you'd, I ah, can't read today. You'd be ready to bet it was butter. And so that made me right in the margin. I can't, I can't believe it's, it's not, not butter. <laughs> yeah, like this... All throughout this, whenever any sort of real uh, or potential ad is being described by any of these people, it's always for something kind of fake, something ersatz, kind of something that has an air of cheapness about it. Whether it's margarine or um, uh, a new brand of, I don't know, digestive tablets or something like that. So it, do you think she has kind of a disdainful attitude? towards the industry and she, she had people say i've been three years in this soul searing profession yeah, so yeah yeah, and, yeah all these people yeah, they, they all kind of a cynical attitude towards their work there's gonna they be know... more interesting comments about that we should we should pay attention yeah. to that but yes yes i mean you're playing like they know creating desires that people don't naturally feel and they know that they're being dishonest yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a large section here where he's looking at some clues and we've got that letter um I mean, this is so hilarious <laughs> that, that Lord Peter wrote. He submitted this. He submitted this as an ad for that. It's a far, far butter thing. Oh, that was, i oh, sorry. I thought that was groan worthy. It's so it's so bad. Reference to Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. Um, I, I, I absolutely delight in these things. Okay. And then, of course, he spotted out as Lord Peter. Mm -hmm. And his coworkers recognize him, but he's able to convince them through body language that that he's not him. And you know, it kind of just reminds you of the old, you know, Clark Kent Superman thing. Like small things can make you think wearing it's somebody else. Or not wearing glasses. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he's got his monocle and he he acts much more posh. And so they 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 don't think it's him. Um let's see. Um I wanted to find, there's some other passages here. Hang on. 
Let's see if I can find these other passages. Well, okay, she starts talking about the bright young things, and we find out that Victor Dean was hanging out with them. What? Who? Where'd that name come from? The bright young things. I don't actually know who coined it. Um, I first heard of it yeah, when I, they made a movie of Evelyn Waugh's vile bodies, and it was named Bright Young Things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the that's the. Oh, wasn't that Stephen Fry who directed mm -hmm. that one? Yeah, back in the early two thousands. Yeah, I, I know it goes back to the nineteen twenties. It was it would have been established slang by this point, and um, yeah, I I, I want to say it was Evelyn Waugh himself, but I think that's probably not right. Um, but uh, yeah, the the fast living, the, the the British equivalent of the sort of people who would show up in an F. Scott Fitzgerald story. Um, th those would be the bright young. Guys. Yes, exactly. The jazz age people, the the beautiful, the beautiful people, right? Mm -hmm. They're out there living celebrity lives and lives of dissipation. Here's another expression that became current at this time: gate crashing. Oh. Like the idea of crashing a party. That actually, yeah, going to a party you're not invited to, and uh, you know, sort of make creating an uproar there. But we was... do see in this chapter when he goes to this party that. Um, there is a youth culture that is is separate from respectable life and everybody knows mm -hmm. about it so there's a lot of drugs which i think might surprise modern listeners that in the 1920s there would be such a drug problem yeah uh so you get beautiful young people who are really living these kind of sad escapist. dissipated sure. escapist sure. lives exactly sure. exactly like life life is meaningless then why not actually it, take drugs you mentioned the Lord Peter is a World War One veteran, and this sort of party is not the sort of place he would go to for fun no. by him on his own no. cognizance. No. I mean, he's there on uh, for work, honestly. He's mm -hmm. investigating. Um, C.S. Lewis also uh, remarked that he felt when he returned from the war, where he was wounded. So C.S. Lewis is, you know, um, a veteran coming back to Oxford. The young men who were just too young to have been in the war, there was a kind of, I don't know, a mental and and just existential divide between them and the guys who were only a year or two older than they were. And Lewis thought that there was, Lewis kind of resented um, that sort of foppishness, that kind of jazz age, um, uh, that, that kind of well, the, the the bright young thing atmosphere that was something which he found obnoxious. So we should say, since it came up, okay. So Evelyn Wall was a member of the Bright Young Things, and then of course grows up and rejects all of that, and 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 writes about it. So in Brideshead Revisited, the character who gives us, who at the beginning is very much the bright young thing, which is Sebastian, who yes. walks around with his teddy bear. He brings his teddy bear to class at Oxford, and he's drunk all the time, and you know, leaning out of windows and vomiting. That character was based on a real person, and it was C.S. Lewis's student. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we've mentioned this before, I think. Uh, yeah, John Betjeman was C.S. Lewis. And he would come actually, to class was, in pajamas, yeah, wouldn't he? Yeah, he, he was a bright young... He was actually a, a friend of Evelyn Waugh. They knew each other at university. They were both dissipated. Evelyn Waugh, Evelyn Waugh barely graduated from Oxford with a passing degree. And um, I think... Uh, there are stories about him spending more hours on the quad drunk than sober. And, and that, yeah. So that was, um, there's actually film footage of. No way. Yeah, there's there's film footage of Evelyn Waugh as a college student in Oxford. It's silent film footage. I don't know if Betjeman appears or not, but uh, yeah, that whole circle of people, like the, the Sitwell siblings also, the, the sister Edith, Edith and her two brothers. Oh, they were funny name, Sacheverell Sitwell, and I can't remember the third one. But yeah, they, they were also, what, tastemakers that we were, were part of this circle at the same time, too. Yeah, it, it really makes sense that C.S. I mean, poor guy, right? You go out there, you you watch all your friends die on this battlefield. You almost die. He, he had shrapnel um, in his body for the rest of his life, and I have a whole theory that this is what killed him. But... Um, then to come back to Oxford to become a teacher and to see these students, ha it had to make you feel like we died for this. This is this is the world we were we were oh, protecting, absolutely. you know, and make you feel very resentful and, and bitter. At the same time, you can see why the world exactly created that kind of student. Mm -hmm. You know, why not just eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we may die. Right. Sure. And 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 that's exactly that's exactly what happened to 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 these people. Uh, so when 
Lord Peter is getting ready to dress up like a Harlequin to go into that party. He actually makes an Alice in Wonderland reference right before. Uh, I should think it would be rather like a muchness, suggested Breeden. Lewis Carroll, you know. Did you ever see a drawing of a muchness? So, of course, that made me immediately say, okay, hmm, are we going to have some upside down world imagery since he's mentioning Lewis Carroll? And so we'll have to see. We'll have to see which one of these is the upside down world. Um, this is the this is the one I was looking for. So they're talking about these drinks. The, okay, these ads. Breeden shuddered. I think this is an awfully immoral job of ours. I do, really. Think how we spoil the digestions of the public. Ah, yes, but think how earnestly we strive to put them right again. We undermine them with one hand and build them up with the other. The vitamins we destroy in the canning, we restore in Revito. The roughage we remove from Peabody's Piper Porridge, we make up into a package and market as Bunbury's breakfast brand. The stomachs we ruin with Pompeii, we reline with peplets to aid digestion. And by forcing the damn fool public to play twice over, wants to have its food emasculated, and wants to have the vitality put back again, we keep the wheels of commerce turning and give employment to thousands, including you and me. This wonderful world, Breeden sighed ecstatically. <laughs> That's fantastic. That was terrible and wonderful. And yes, that was that was brilliant and frightening. What a fantastic observation, that, that, though. That's again, exactly this, so. This is the first generation of the first generation. That's yes. right. They haven't even really gotten going yet. That's right. Oh no, because really the the ads, if you if you look yeah, at the pop up ads, don't exist yet. Well, and the ads of the nineteen twenties are super. Again, I collect these. They're very very different than modern ads. One of the things I think that shocks oh, no, people the first, artful. they're very artful, but also they have a ton of copy, tons of words, tons of words. Like like just a whole long description. They're trying to like set a scene, and and it's very very different now where our our ads are so don't have words and they don't even have images like you can watch a commercial and be like i don't even know what this is an ad for everybody's very beautiful and they seem really happy but what is this an ad for it's kind of funny i mean you mentioned her toucan ad and you can still buy toucan guinness glasses and things like that um so th that's that's one that had that is one that has had some staying power another one actually is the michelin man cuz the michelin man of course is um, that was originally a French thing. It was a French tire company in Lyon. And the funny thing is, I um, if you look up the original Michelin Man ads, there's something more French about them. Because the Michelin Man, he's still the big swollen mm -hmm. yeah, pile of tires. But he'll be holding a glass of champagne and wearing pince-nez glasses. Oh, wow. And he was actually intended to be kind of a celebration of this French spirit. But wow. no one internationally took it all seriously. So, yeah, there you are. Okay, so we find out about Victor Dean's sister. We found out that this coworker, Mr. Willis, was obsessed with Pamela Dean, uh, that he had a falling out with Victor Dean, who was his best mm -hmm. friend. And we know that the falling out had to do with the fact that Victor was going around with this bright young thing. And Victor felt like this was a, a you know immoral influence on Pamela, the sister. Uh, there's also still good good stuff here, like the, a long list of slogans. And then Lord Peter says, Upon my soul, I sometimes wonder why the long-suffering public doesn't rise up and slay us. They don't know of our existence, said Garrett. They all think advertisements write themselves. When I tell people I'm in advertising, they always ask whether I design posters. They never think about the copy. Actually, that's a very Chestertonian sort of moment there. I mean, the, 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 I mean, the idea that so many of the decisions we make are influenced by people, we people don't in, in the corporate or the political world or the world of ads, whatever it is that yeah, we couldn't name the, the anonymous influencer uh, or the anonymous bureaucrat who, you know, uh, contrives any number of regulations. Or now the are, anonymous are, are algorithm. Bad. We have to live. Yeah, the anonymous, the anonymous algorithm is tr creating a desire in us for stuff. OK, so. <clears throat> He goes to this party and it's wild and it's crazy and he doesn't like it. But now he's in two disguises. So we'll have to come back to this. So he's in disguise at the ad agency and he's in disguise um, at the party as the Harlequin. And then in chapter five, we find out who he really is, that he's Lord Peter. And this whole thing is an undercover sting. Since you mentioned Harlequin, I, um, Harlequin is the clever servant who solves problems in the Italian Commedia dell'arte. Ah. And um, often who often who gets the girl with whom the hapless Piero is in love. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. 
The Harlequin also, according to Northrop Fry, is often appears in these significant descent moments. Mm -hmm. So he descends into this other world of drugs and money and party uh, in that disguise. Oh, that's very good. That's very good. And so he goes to talk to his brother and they start and the brother says, well, what about truth and advertising? And I thought that was a really interesting setup here. So you've got the quote unquote truth in advertising versus the real truth that Lord Peter is there to try to uncover the truth about this, this death. Um, so really that whole chapter five is really kind of the exposition of this is the case and this is why I'm involved. And we find out that the drug problem is very severe. His brother-in-law remarks that, uh, yeah, we shouldn't have, um, we shouldn't have, uh, what does he say, uh, decommissioned our Coast Guard because now we have the importation of uh, illegal substances, which is becoming a real problem. Yes. And boy, didn't it just ring so incredibly contemporary that he's saying, yeah, we can go pick up the local guy, but he doesn't know where it came from. And if we've got his dealer, that guy wouldn't know where it came from. So, you know, yeah. no one, you have to get to the root problem and, and they're having trouble. Um, so, yeah, again, I mean, opium, of course, was an issue in the 19th, the 19th century, century really. but um, I mean, you have the opium wars. And right, exactly. But really, the recreational drug use that's more of a 20th century thing mm -hmm. uh particularly why like the hemingway crowd what they all have on we they're just bored they take drugs and alcohol because they're just bored with their lives um i love how chapter five ends though with those contrasting anxiety dreams so pamela dean falls to sleep right and she's and she can't stop and she's not falling asleep she's can't stop thinking about Romantic lord peter game, yeah. right and but it but it's all given to us in these little like little almost advertising clips his hands his voice right it's so good and then we flip to um mr willis who can't stop also thinking of his jealous thoughts in those same kind of like if you look at the text everything's dot 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 dot, dot right very advertising and then you get to the end lord peter whimsy went home and slept right I so, that. so everything's that was a fine touch so everything's just oh i mean it's four pages of dot 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 just like rapid fire advertising speak but peter's not in that he goes home and he goes to sleep i love that but but this is one of my favorite lines in the whole book too so uh it the last paragraph there right before the lord peter went, went home and slept it's 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 actual advertising stuff and i love this so this is this. So she's showing the frantic thoughts of Pamela Dean, the frantic thoughts of Mr. Willis, and then the frantic advertising thoughts. And this is so good. After just like a whole paragraph of all these ads, it says, whatever you're doing, stop it and do something else. And I thought if that is not modernity in a nutshell, right, that kind of anxiety, whatever you're doing, stop it, and do something else. But Lord Peter is not like that. Lord Peter is someone else entirely and not affected by that. He goes home and he goes to sleep. I love that. I agree no, with she, you. This she is does a great wonderful setup. job, yeah, making the ad industry seem both shallow and also sinister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's so. I mean, it's um, propaganda for products, and uh, and yeah, this is. I mean, kind of to summarize the great age of propaganda. I mean, you know, Marconi's you know invention of uh, of the radio. Uh, Hitler actually said when he came to power that if Marconi had not invented the radio we would never have seized control of Germany. Um, so it's, it's you know, politicians and demagogues and would-be dictators are using kind of the same methods to prop themselves up and sell their uh, sell their ideals such as they are as, um, yeah, the guy who advertises toothpaste. So, now that's a yeah. fine point to connect advertising with propaganda. Mm -hmm. We can bring this up again on the next episode, but it's after World War II that a lot of stuff happens very badly, unfortunately, in language theory as, as people struggle with the fact that they were so easily manipulated by propaganda. Um, they end up doing some things that C.S. Lewis thinks made it worse. But more about that next time. So um, next time we'll cover 6 through 11, um, and, and we'll see what else Lord Peter's going to get himself up to in these in these next set of chapters and i look forward to uh talking about this with you guys next week don't forget about our how to read a symphony webinar coming up in october and you can find out about that at houseofhumaneletters.com shout out to our patreon listeners uh you can join those if you go to the uh, patreon.com backslash the literary life and you can join that very thriving community um so all right we'll uh, see you guys next time and until then keep crafting your literary life because stories will save the world.
Thank you for listening to the Literary Life Podcast, brought to you by our loyal Patreon sponsors. Visit houseofhumaneletters.com to find Angelina and Thomas and to sign up for our newsletter with podcast schedules and more. And keep up with Cindy at morningtimeformoms.com. Join the conversation at our member-only Patreon forum or our Facebook discussion group. Visit patreon.com backslash the literary life to find out how you can sponsor this podcast and get great bonus content. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review, and check out our sister podcasts, The New Mason Jar and The Well-Read Poem. And now for a poem read by poet Thomas Banks. Portrait of a Barmaid by Edith Sitwell. Metallic waves of people jar through crackling green towards the bar, where on the tables chattering white the sharp drinks quarrel with the light. Those colored muslin blinds the smiles, shroud wooden faces in their wiles. Sometimes they splash like water, you yourself reflected in their hue. The conversation loud and bright, seems spinal bars of shunting light in fireworks spurting greenery. O oh, complicate machinery for building babble, iron crane beneath your hair, that blue-ribbed mane in noise and murder like the sea without its mutability. Outside the bar, where jangling heat seems out of tune and off the beat, a concertina's glycerin exudes and mirrors in the green your soul pure glucose edged with hints of tentative and half-soiled tints.